Today's video is going to be on Taylor series. It's going to be an introduction for people who have no idea what it is and essentially we're going to go through on what it is, how to find it, as well as the derivation that it gives us for the complex functions such as e to the ix equals cosine of x plus i sine x. Taylor series, sometimes also called the McLaurin series. If you don't know what it is, it's essentially a way of approximating functions values by recreating the function as a series of polynomials. An example is estimating sine of x as x. You've probably seen the memes, but it is actually an entirely legitimate way of estimating sine of x. Of course, we could make this a more accurate estimation by increasing the series, but even by approximating sine x as x, it isn't that bad of an approximation. Take sine of 0.2. Its value is approximately 0.2. What is the point of a polynomial approximation? I mean, I did just find an approximate value of sine of 0.2 by plugging the number 0.2 into the function. What's stopping us from doing this other times? When modelling real life phenomena using mathematics, things get pretty complicated. You'll have nested functions and numbers raised to weird powers. Integrating and differentiating these become a pain. But integrating and differentiating polynomials is simple. It's often the first computation taught on calculus. Taylor series also has some other cool uses as well, as we'll see later in the video. We can use it to calculate cosine of i, as well as derive the famous equation e to the ix equals cosine of x plus i times sine x. On the screen now, I'll flash up the definition for Taylor series. It won't make much sense now, but by the end of the video, it will be crystal clear. Let's create a function f of x, which is equal to e of x. And let's suppose that we wanted to find approximate values near f of 0. Our new function will be called t of x. t of x will have a series of polynomials to estimate values near f of 0. Now if our estimations are to be any accurate at all, f of 0 should be equal to e to the power of 0. So that's where we start. t to the power of x equals e to the power of 0, which is 1. Our next step is to get the initial rate of change to match up. That is, to create a tangent line at point x equals 0 that matches up with e to the x. But how do we do this? We can add some factor of x. To get the rate of change to match up, we have to set the first derivatives equal to one another. The derivative of e to the x must equal the derivative of t of x. Now, t of x is 1 plus some constant times x. Taking the derivative of both sides, we can get e to the power of x equals that constant. And at x equals 0, e to the x equals 1. So our constant is 1. Hence our function t of x equals 1 plus x. And the tangent lines do in fact match up. To make this estimation a little more accurate, we can match up the next order of derivatives. The second derivative of e to the x must equal the second derivative of t of x, or 1 plus x plus some constant times x squared. After differentiating, we get the derivative of e to the x equals the derivative of 1 plus 2 times some constant times x. And differentiating again, we get e to the power of x equals 2 times some constant. And at x equals 0, that's 1 equals 2 times that constant, so the constant is a half. As you can see, as the order of derivatives rise, the previous terms and constants all fall to 0. Plugging in the new constant, we get our function 1 plus x plus a half of x squared. Let's compute a few more terms and see if we can start to see a pattern. After computing the third derivative, we get t of x equals 1 plus x plus a half of x squared plus a sixth of x cubed. Let's pause for a second and try and spot the pattern here. This should make things a bit more obvious. t of x equals 1 over 1 times x to the power of 0, plus 1 times x to the power of 1, plus a half times x squared, plus a sixth of x cubed. Now the increasing powers is an obvious component, but what about the denominators? Where have we seen this pattern before? The answer is in factorials x to the power of 0 over 0 factorial plus x to the power of 1 over 1 factorial plus x squared over 2 factorial and x cubed over 3 factorial. Using this, we can generalize a formula. 
we call this generalized formula the Taylor series of e to the power of x. As a small side note, we can use this Taylor series to explore one of the famous definitions of e. Let's plug in x equals 1 into t of x. Now because t of x models e to the x, we should get e to the power of 1, or just e. All the powers in this series go to just 1, because 1 raised to any power will remain 1. This leaves us with the following definition. Something cool Taylor series gives us is a connection to the complex world. We can explore one of Euler's formulas, e to the power of ix, as well as cosine of i, using Taylor series. Let's start by finding the Taylor series of cosine of x. Let's start with our first term, cosine of 0, which gives us 1. When we go to compute the next term to get the tangent line, we find that the derivative of cosine of x is negative sine of x, and sine of 0 is 0, which means our next term is a zero term. What about the constant for the third term? The second derivative of cosine of x is equal to the second derivative of 1 plus some constant times x squared. After differentiating both sides, negative sine of x equals 2 times some constant times x, and negative cosine of x equals 2 times that constant, and plugging in x equals zero, we get negative of half equals the constant. Adding one more term, skipping the third one as the third term will go to zero, we get the fourth derivative of cosine of x equals the fourth derivative of one minus a half of x squared plus some constant times x to the fourth. And I'll just show up the algebra on the screen. And eventually we arrive at the constant equals 1 over 24. So we get t of x equals 1, take a half of x squared, plus 1 over 24 times x to the power of 4. It doesn't take too long to spot the pattern here, the alternating sign as well as only even powers of x. And also notice that the denominator this time isn't just n factorial, but 2n factorial. Let's rewrite this with different notation. And something interesting happens when we plug in i for the value of x. First, i to the power of 2 equals negative 1 to the power of k, but since we have two negative 1s to the power of k, they multiply to just 1, leaving the sum of 1 over 2k factorial. This sums to about 1.543. This is also equal to the hyperbolic trig function cosine h of 1. It's quite crazy to think that the cosine of a complex number gives a real number result, but it does get crazier because we can link the Taylor series of cosine and sine to derive the famous formula e to the power of ix equals cosine of x plus i times sine x. First, it's important to familiarize yourself with the Taylor series of sine of x. You're free to calculate this yourself if you'd like. Let's go back to the Taylor series for e to the x. Let's plug in ix as the value of x. The first few terms include 1 plus ix plus 1 half times i squared times x squared. And since we're squaring the value of i, this makes the polynomial a negative. Again, our next term will be negative as well, leaving 1 sixth i x cubed. And these are the next two terms. Now something happens when we separate the real and complex sides of this sum. Let's factor out the complex variable. This makes it obvious to see that the real part of the sum is just cosine of x, and the complex part is i times the Taylor series for sine of x. This leaves the famous formula e to the power of ix equals cosine of x plus i times sine of x. From this, we can plug in pi as x to get the famous identity. Cosine of pi goes to negative 1, and the complex component goes to 0, leaving e to the power of i pi equaling negative 1. 